Hello, Guy Warren. Hi, Richard. Nice to see you again. G'day. <laughs> Very nice to catch up with you. Um, and uh, your exhibition is New Work Plus at King Street Gallery on William in Sydney. But before we talk about the exhibition, there is something very important that has happened uh, really just in the last uh, week or two, and that is that you have celebrated your 99th birthday. Uh, and for anybody who wasn't aware of that, happy birthday. Well, it's very kind of you to, to mention it, but uh, I've decided to to put it another way, I'm not 99, I'm in my 100th year. That sounds much more exciting. <laughs> it does, and, and it has an extra frisson of dignity to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> well, anyway, look, congratulations on entering your 100th year. Um, <laughs> right. uh, and I guess you probably, in these times of social isolation, didn't have the chance to, to celebrate with friends and family quite as much as you would have planned. <clears throat> no, well, it's it's um, it's affected everything. Obviously, it affected my ability to work and where I work, and how big I work and what I'm doing. Yes, it's it's affected everything. Mm. Well, we see you uh, today there in your studio um, with uh, all sorts of works behind you, and, and I know from recent conversations that you and I have had that actually you've been working harder than ever during this time of <laughs> lockdown. How has that been? Well, because of the lockdown, I can no longer go to my larger studio at Leichhardt. I'm forced to work at home, and this is a fairly small studio. So inevitably, of course, one has to uh, restrict what one can do in, in relation to that. So I'm working on smaller works and doing a lot of drawing. So all the works, that are on the wall or things that I've done in the last few weeks. And yes, I've been grateful for the time. I'm in the studio every day, it's marvelous. <laughs> it is marvelous to hear. Well, some of those works that we can see on the wall are um, reminiscent or resonate with some of the works that uh, viewers will be able to see in the exhibition. Yeah, yeah. And just a reminder to the viewer uh, that the idea with these interviews is to be able to go to the gallery website to find the exhibition, look at the exhibition images of the work, and then perhaps ideally uh, listen to and watch this conversation at the same time. Uh, so let's, let's go to the rainforest first of all, Guy, uh, because I know that's very close to your heart. Um, there are a number of works related to the rainforest uh, with titles ranging from Jamboree Brush, uh, Figured Forest, uh, Bend in the Track One. Those, I presume, are mainly to do with the rainforest uh, at Jamboree, where you built a house many years ago. Yeah, well, I, it's, it's not a house. It's a, it's a shed but it's something that I can live in and uh, stay in and work in. Um, yeah, rainforest has been part of my life for a long time. It started off, oddly enough, in the army in southwest Queensland when I did a um, an army jungle warfare training course. My God, that's a lifetime ago. And then several years in New Guinea and in the island of Bougainville, I fell in love with rainforest. Uh, why? I'm not quite sure. I think probably because um, it surrounds you, you're part of it, you're not separated from it. Uh, it's around you. The lianas that writhe through the forest are like line drawings in, in, in three dimensions. The whole thing is like a painting that encompasses you and your part of it and I find that very exciting. I guess this leads me to my own prejudices. Much as I love the old landscape painters and there have been hundreds, thousands of them, all wonderful painters, but they all tend to look at the landscape as though it's got nothing to do with them, something to be admired or looked at or used or made use of in some way. 
all look, you know, looking at it as though it's one of God's great gifts, all of which are probably true. But they never feel as though they belong to it. And I've always, I think my time in, in the jungles of New Guinea um, showed me how the indigenous people there feel about the landscape, much the same way as, uh, as the Australian Aboriginals, their, our own people. They, they feel they belong to the landscape and the landscape belongs to them and we're all part of it. So that's really what it's all about. There is a, a sense in these images uh, in the exhibition uh, that that one is is embraced by the rainforest. That uh, one has a sense of you within the rainforest and enjoying that's exactly that what sense it is, of life. Yes. Yeah. Um, and also, one there, there is a feel because uh, with some of the works, uh, one of them, figured forest, for example, where there are figures in the rainforest, one almost feels as though. Uh, they are perhaps in some way spirits of the forest that you you, you seem to... I don't know, do, I don't uh, intend them to be that, but I don't mind if people see them like that. Um, some people see them as being a reference to Aboriginal drawings on rock caves. They're not intended to be that either, but I'm more than happy to be associated with that idea. It's really about, I hope, um, the feeling of the fact that we are all part of the one establishment. <laughs> it's part of, it's, it's, it's the Gaia theory. Yes. It's that sense that, that, that the, uh, well, the earth, Gaia and, and the forest and every type of landscape is actually part of one living entity. And uh, there is one work in the exhibition which refers to a number of figures that you've uh, represented over the years where uh, humans and rainforest plants almost merge that there's a, a human figure that has tree fern a tree, <laughs> yes, tree fern fronds growing out of their head um, but there's a work in the exhibition called lunch in the forest where the participants in that lunch all have either tree fern or palm fronds growing out of their head and uh, it's a lovely nod to Manet's uh, Déjeuner sur l'air, I, I presume. Yes, it was. <laughs> but, but tell us about that sense of uh, literally leaves growing from people. Are these those? Well, it, it's just a bit of fantasy on my part, I guess, but uh, the country there, the side of the mountain is covered with rainforest and the rainforest is covered with tree ferns. And tree ferns to me always look like women, uh, particularly after rain and they're healthy and green and gorgeous and beautiful. And they th seem to throw, be throwing their hair in the air in, in joyous celebration of being alive. So I thought, well, why not? do that, make them look like <laughs> tree fern ladies. So they're my tree fern women, yep. And they exist all around my shack. They are, they are a, a wonderfully, uh, a wonderfully ebullient form of plant growth. So very lovely to see. Um, something else with which you have a, a very strong sense of relationship and, and indeed a, a very long history is the Shoalhaven River. Um, down near Nowra uh, in the Shoalhaven area of New South Wales. We see a number of works in this exhibition to do uh, with the Shoalhaven River series, going back, in fact, to 2007. Um, the Shoalhaven River was something which, even as a youth, you had huge adventures on. Tell us about that. Yes. Uh, it all started in 1948, if one can remember back that far. <laughs> I'm afraid not, no. I certainly can. I was probably about 17, I guess. And my brother and I and uh, two other young guys put, a, put canoes in the river somewhere up near Goulburn, near Braidwood, I think it was, and decided to uh, take 
pedal down the river all the way to the mouth of the river at Nowra. In those days, there was no open, freely running, beautiful, clear. Um, we had most wonderful times and uh, beautiful water all the way, uh, clean water. Um, had a few ghastly accidents, but somehow managed to survive them all. <laughs> Lost the canoe. Uh, no. um, it was one of those boys' own adventure stories at 17. It's the sort of the sort of images that you remember all your life. And yeah, yeah I keep on drawing it. I keep on... One keeps referring to those significant images which were important at various stages of one's life. I guess the tree fern lady, uh, the canoe trip down the river, uh, certain elements of uh, New Guinea and Bougainville, all these images remain in your mind forever and they keep popping out. Simple as that. It is lovely to see, uh, and in a number of those uh, Shoalhaven images in the exhibition, we can actually see figures in a canoe, which I presume are a, ref a reference back yep. uh, to that very important trip sure. that you made. Um, I should just mention to the viewer that uh, you, unfortunately, the connection between us broke up a couple of times during your answer there. We got most of that answer and hopefully that won't happen too much as we go on, but uh, let's keep fingers crossed. Technology will be on our side. Uh, going to other uh, places that you've been to and responded to, and you mentioned a little while ago about your your sense of the indigenous, the Australian indigenous relationship with the landscape. Um, that is visible or apparent in some of the Central Australian works that are also in this exhibition uh, from around 2019. Uh, big yellow rock with figures near Alice, um, hill with figures, part of the Ross River series. Uh, again, when you went to Central Australia, how did you respond to that landscape to produce those works? I went first to Central Australia in... Um, oh, that was 1948. One loses track of times, I find, in 99. Um, when we went down the river at uh, when we went down Shoalhaven, that must have been much, much earlier than the 48, 1948 figure I gave you. Um, it was much, much earlier than that. It must have been in the uh, I, I 30s, think I guess. It was just... Anyway, 1948, yeah. I hitchhiked to Alice Springs with a friend of mine mm. uh, just after I came out of the army. and. Uh, we decided we wanted to see a bit of Australia, so we decided to hitchhike to the Ellis. So that was my first visit. But I've been back many times more recently in the last few years with artist friends. And Alice and the country around Alice is full of myths and images and ghosts, if you like, memories, um, real or imagined, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's full of stories, obviously, for some people. For myself, I can imagine them or feel them. It's it's a it's a country that calls to be recorded is the wrong word to be responded to. I don't like recording for its own sake. I see no point in merely recording, I'd rather find some way of responding emotionally, spiritually. No, that all sounds a bit pompous, doesn't it? Well, Look, occasionally I draw the landscape as it is, but I prefer to play with the landscape and let it tell me what it wants me to do. It's a bit like a painting. A painting tells you what it needs you don't impose yourself on the painting. It's a 
conversation you have with it mm. and it tells you what to do and one has to one has to respond it's interesting it <laughs> yes absolutely it makes sense um it's interesting there are a couple of works in the exhibition uh, which i'm presuming are from quite a while ago um which are uh drawings or works about the andes um, I'm not sure if you uh, yeah. recall those. And they do seem to be more of a literal or more traditional record keeping of a landscape. Do you, do you recall that reaction to the Andes when you... Yes, were I do indeed. I think um, on, a few years ago, I went to stay with a friend in Ecuador and my son came with me and I knew the Andes were there. <laughs> One can't avoid them, one knows they've always been there. Um, but I hadn't realised they were so damn big. They are huge. I mean, here in Australia, all our mountains have been worn down over the millennia. But the Andes were huge. I mean, you look down the streets at, at Santiago and there's this damn great mass of mountain right in front of you. You can't ignore them. I mean, when you fly in, you're flying beside them, they are so, so huge. And I did a lot of drawing from the plane and from the ground and from cars, and just for the sheer fun of drawing them. Uh, there are indeed some figures in some of the drawings, but yeah, I, I just like drawing, so that's how they came about. Yes. Going back to uh, the, the Central Australian works, um, there are at least a couple of works that have very large, very solid, um, you know, orangey, that rich orange ochre rock. Uh, I think one of them from a while back is called The Guardian, um, but there are a couple with, uh, with very large, solid orange-yellow rocks. Was that element of the landscape something that particularly spoke to you? Yes, it was. I, I think the rocks, uh, most of the last few times I've been there, we've been at a place called Ross River, and there are particular um, hills, mountains, rock formations, the sort of thing which makes you feel that you knew more or anything about geology, because the shapes are really quite extraordinary, the textures are marvellous. Um, I was impressed, surprised, delighted to find them so huge, so strangely sculpted, so textured, and so immensely red and rich and colourful. Mm. Yeah, they're memories, mm. once again. Mm. Wonderful memories. I'd like to turn uh, for a moment to you were talking about textures and uh, and aspects of that sort, but now actually to some of the materials and some of the the media that you're using in your more recent work, we can see some of it on the wall behind you in your studio, uh, and some of that, as it is in the exhibition, some of it is quite quite sparse, very very subtle, uh, relatively soft. Is that something that you've come to with? greater enthusiasm in more recent times? Well, I do, particularly out in the bush, I use watercolour a lot. So they, a lot of them look um, sparse or soft for that reason. Um, I'm happy to use the blank spaces on the paper. Um, one doesn't have to fill it all. The great joy about putting any marks on a surface is what it does. Any mark on a surface. Oh. There's my phone that I'm going to forget it. <laughs> That's all right. I'm going to turn it off. I can't do anything about it. Not, not to um, worry. We can, we can just ignore it. <laughs> can you? Okay. Well, um, we, more or less. <laughs> yeah, look. Uh, As soon as you put a mark down, it calls for another mark. We've mentioned this already. Yes. And it doesn't only call for another mark. It means that there's an awful lot of space there that has nothing on it yet. 
and the the important thing is to put find other things to put on that space which main, maintains the vitality of that space which still retains the and makes an emphasis on the energy of that space not just space it's it's about energy it's about it's like a poem it has to work as a poem and every the spaces between the words are just as important as the words like music well that's a lousy description i'm sorry but offhand that's the best i could do <laughs> It's a wonderful and very emotive description, uh, and you you used the words energy and vitality, and it has been wonderful as we've spoken to you to see the energy and the vitality that you oh, are uh, going me. towards your work and and this exhibition. So, Guy Warren, thank you very much for sharing your exhibition with us. My my pleasure. Thanks for letting me do it. Thank you.